Welcome back to Nights of Horror. Tonight we have part three of Matt Ryan Tobin. is a uh, child's play two yes yeah, the best of oh. the whole series okay so was that a personal Absolutely. choice then or the the uh the mondo's like i had child's play two. i've always wanted to do child's play two um okay. i've had i had that concept in my head for quite a few years actually and what was happening was uh, and i was talking to gary pullen one day and he goes, oh, this is what I'm working on for Texas Frightmare. And he sent me his Child's Play poster. And I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> I was like, I was like, we have a very, very similar idea. It's only mine's for the sequel. And I sent it to him. And, he, and he's like, dude, that's awesome. And I'm like, you don't think that's overstepping? And he's like, not at all. He goes, yo, send that to Mondo. So I did. And then they're like, yep, this works. You guys can release them together. And it'll be a cool little, almost like a collab. And I was like, that's a great idea. Because me and Gary have always wanted to work on a singular thing together. Yeah, I have I have something I've pitched to him for a while to work on. It's just about us finding the time to do it, but I think it'd be really fun when it does happen. But um, and so yeah, that just it just happened to work out like that. And then when you put them side by side, they they complement each other very well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I love that movie. Child's Play Two is 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 genius. It's one of the best sequels I think, just in general. Okay. It's up there with like Terminator Two to Terminator. Okay. You know what I mean? It's I think it's fantastic. I the original's tell you, great. I I am but, not a child's play fan. I had a my buddy growing up, and that, so did I. Like, and I was terrified of it. Yeah, because I saw it move. <laughs> I, saw I am it. convinced to this day. Thirty <laughs> years later, I saw that thing move. Yeah, <laughs> just like you know, like a, just a shutter, <laughs> and like it went into the closet and lived in the closet from then on out. You know, I can't really turn my computer, but I've got uh, one of those good guy replicas hanging up on the okay. wall up there. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no Chucky, no, Chucky was no an early one for me. <laughs> Chucky was an early one for me. Like I, I, you know, like I said, I was born in the late eighties. So, yeah. um, I think actually before I even saw Pet Cemetery, <clears throat> I was intrigued by Child's Play just as a kid going to the video store and creeping around the, the horror section, you know what I mean? Okay. And then I, I remember always seeing the VHS cover for Child's Play 2. Okay. He's like standing there, he's got the scissors with the, the jack mm -hmm. in the box. And it's got like terrifying. a frown on its face, yeah. Yeah, terrifying to like, you know, a four-year-old or whatever. But I kept wanting to, and like, you know, every time you go back to the 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 rental store, you get a little bit closer, inch a little bit closer down the aisle, be like, till you finally got it in your hands. And then, you know, and then you, but you're just enthralled, right? You're intrigued by it. like, this scares me, but I think it's cool, you know? Um, and so, yeah, Child's Play, I've loved it since I was a little kid. And, and I hold that second one really near and dear because I think it's written very smart. It's a very smart film. I think it has a lot of very Hitchcockian choices in its in its direction and its cinematography. Okay. I can't tell if you're laughing because you disagree. Or, or, I, or it has laughing. been so long since I have watched Child's Watch Play movies. Watch it again. Movies. Watch it All again. Right. Oh, um, John, I am, John, I'll be emailing you. Do it, <laughs> John. John Lafia, who directed it, um, it's it's brilliantly shot. It really is, um, and uh, I think it, it 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 does what sequels do. It it just amps everything up. So you have your alien and your aliens, you know, you have your Terminator one, Terminator two, you know, um, and I could think of a thousand other examples, but that's what it does. It takes what we learned in the first one and just gives you more and just turns it up a little bit. And, the, well, and it's just, I think it's great. But the first one, the first one in terms of just straight up horror, I think you should watch the first two if you haven't seen them in a long time, because the first one is um, acted incredibly. Um, Everyone has a birthday they'll always remember. Can we open my presents now, Mommy? 
A good guy! I know it! <laughs> I, I'm Chucky. He's something, isn't he? This is Andy's. Time for bed, Andy. Can I beg you? Night, Aunt Maggie. Night, Chucky. Everyone knows most accidents happen at home. How did that happen? This is no accident. Andy! I'm Detective Mike Norris. Homicide. Andy! Miss Peterson's dead, Miss Barkley. She fell from the kitchen window. Someone's moved in with the Barkley family. And so has terror. Nobody believes you about Chucky. He came alive in my hand. I, I, I... Oh, for God's sake. Why won't you believe me? Because I'm sane. This is Barkley. Sane and rational. No one believes the truth. <laughs> or lives to tell it. There's nothing nice about murder. <laughs> And there's nothing innocent about child's play. Especially Alex Vincent, like that, that performance as a young actor is, is incredible. Um, but it's a dark, again, it kind of feels Hitchcockian or maybe even Twilight Zoney a little bit, but okay. it's good. It's a dark movie. The second one's definitely leans more into the campy, but um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic film. All right. Uh, the next one you did is a piece I really enjoyed. Uh, returning to David Lynch uh, for Mad Duck, you did Blue Velvet. Mm-hmm. Um, again, a pretty conceptual piece uh, that feels very Lynchian, nonetheless. Uh, did you have like, um, was this a? They asked you and you had a clear cut idea, or how, how did this one come about? Because it is they had pitched a little me, bit more strange. They had pitched me several uh, a list, or they. P- they had sent me a handful of titles. Um, and here's the thing. I think a lot of people, they have like a preconceived notion of, of the things that I like. And they're like, couldn't be more wrong most of the time. You know, like someone's like, hey, you know, you want to do RoboCop? And I'm like, no, let's do Mrs. Doubtfire. You know what I mean? Like I have very strange, like my, my just because I know I focus a lot on horror doesn't mean that that's, you know, the only sandbox I like playing in. So they had sent me um, a few titles and just nothing was clicking. And I was like, listen, clearly have a list of, of titles that are available. Just shoot them over my way and, and we'll find something, you know, because I'd love to work together again, right? And there was Blue Velvet. And I was like, there it is, Blue Velvet. I already have an idea in my brain just from seeing that on the list. And that was the idea that was, and that was it. I pitched one concept, went through approval and they're like, that's great. We avoid likeness. And, and by by and we actually had um, um, uh, Isabella Rossellini's likeness. We could okay. I could have drawn her face, but my idea didn't involve her actually having her face. Not because I don't like drawing faces, but because I think it worked better for the concept. I think so too. I like I like that I wanted to kind of create a sort of what I imagine a jazz lounge gig poster would look like for like, you know, a crooner's performance. Like I wanted it to have this very blue, like loungy vibe to it. Um, very romanticized, um, but mysterious film noir. I wanted all these ideas and there's several ideas in that concept that kind of all go together. But um, it was just like, again, just the, the, um, the, the sparks just were going off as soon as I saw the title and I love that movie. And so it's interesting yeah. because i mean um there's a couple things i mean it's interesting because obviously with your choice you didn't have uh, kyle mcclatchin in it at all um but you do have sort of like dennis hopper coming out um uh sort of in the center has this like creepy that's actually that's that's kyle mclaughlin in the center is it kyle mcclatchin okay yeah. i thought yeah. i've always yeah. thought it was dennis hopper no it's kyle mcclaughlin and he's he's again we didn't have his likeness so that he's silhouetted okay. um but it, that's him sort of with his so he's coming uh, out of the, it's when he's in their apartment then yeah, that, that's sort of capturing the, the, the voyeuristic aspect of the film, of him peering into a world that he knows nothing about. Um, 
in, and and even if you look at, at the shape of the opening of the drape, shut up. It's actually Steady reminiscent of a knife blade. Where's my bourbon? Okay, I'm, I, I, so, I've looked at this poster so much, and I, I there's I, a lot I, of layers. There's a lot of layers to that, and then this too for myself. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of layers to it, and then on top of the fact that um, Isabella Rossellini is just in, inherently darkness, like her whole life is darkness, like she's hiding. That's that's why I kind of made her sort of hollow. You know, like her, her body is, there's like a facade, but there's nothing kind of beneath it. But then I, you know, I love the song Blue Velvet. It's a, mm -hmm. well, that's the thing, like the opening frame of Blue, uh, of the movie is that like white picket fence with the red flowers and things. I can hear that frame yeah, <laughs> when I see right? it, you know? Yeah. And so, like, I don't... yeah, yeah. But um, I know, the, uh, so we had actually three versions of that poster. There's one that's just, where it's just sort of simple and black. And then we did one where her, her body's filled with a night sky, which mm -hmm. is harkens back to the lyrics of Blue Velvet. Um, and I kind of, I wanted to have that version because I felt like it was getting really dark. And, and even though the film is very dark, I wanted to have this sort of semblance of a dreamy, hopeful kind of peace sort of feeling to it. And that's why I wanted it like, stars in her eyes like this kind of hope aspect to the other version i just wanted to have two two versions of it i don't know i couldn't decide on which conveyed everything more but as far as i was concerned the star version is is the the main one because like most you know lynch films and pieces they're very there's multiple layers that just mm -hmm. keep going keep going so i was like let's just let's just fill it with everything just you know take the rules away the other thing with the uh, the piece is, you know, because Lynch, you always have uh, like music videos happen a lot in Lynch pieces and people don't think of it that way because mm -hmm. you have not just that scene, you have the scene where they go to the like strange like drug dealer house and he performs another Roy Orbison song, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the candy colored clown or whatever the lyric yeah. is, it's so yeah. strange. Um, but yeah. You know, the, particularly the new series of Twin Peaks, right? You have massive just music videos. Oh yeah, the, uh, at the end of the every bang, bang. Yeah, yeah, including like an eleven-minute nine-inch nails video. Yeah, in episode yeah. eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually I love that soundtrack. I I, have, I picked that up on vinyl. There's some some great great bands featured in that show. And then, but, I mean, um, it's interesting because you focused in on that. Because I mean, I, the one I mostly always think about because I'm obsessed <laughs> with is Mulholland Drive and the Silencio scene. Yeah. And I mean, you got, it echoes that a little bit too. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, well, it has that, it, it feels very somber overall. And even in that scene, the Silencio scene, it's, it's heartbreaking. That scene mm -hmm. is like really emotional and it has a lot to do with the melody in that song too. You could be singing about anything, but the melody of that song is heart wrenching uh, of that song is heart wrenching. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I think David Lynch is, uh, especially the work from in that time frame, that era of him, I guess, you know, mid to late eighties into the nineties, like a lot of his films had that sorrowful, somber tone to them that I think they all, they all kind of correlate mm -hmm. with each other, you know? No, I think they explain each other actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you have to take them as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it's a, it's a really cool poster. I, and then of course uh, it's worth mentioning there's a velvet version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not velvet in, in terms of like a velvet black light poster, although that would have been awesome. But we, we've, I found a paper. This is a very, very pricey, expensive paper <laughs> that I convinced them to use. <laughs> and um, it's actually, I believe the paper was called, just not to be a nerd, but um, it was called Curious Skin. And it's a type of metallic paper, but the, the feeling on it is like, it's, vel it's velvety, like it's meant to right. mimic velvet, but it almost has like this rubber, but it's not a rub. It's very hard to explain. You just have to feel it. But what's funny is what I didn't realize is like the coverage of ink on that poster would essentially negate all texture you would feel from the paper because the paper beneath it, once you place the ink on top of it, the paper, you can feel that texture anymore. And the only bits of blue are little hints of blue that are around the edges of things. And so it's kind of like, oh, you can't really feel it now at this point. But either way, it's so, it, it creates a nice shimmer, a nice velvety satin effect, you know. Okay. Um, your next piece was for Plan 9 uh, that I've got here. And it was The House of the Devil, which is uh, one of my favorite more contemporary horror films. Mm -hmm. um, 
how did this one come about? Because I feel like this is also an obscure one to a lot of people. <clears throat> uh, as far as I can remember, he was just, he was pitched to me, simple, hey, do you want to do House of the Devil? And I had seen it. <laughs> I feel like that's the story of your life, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hey, do, you want to do this? <laughs> I'm sure, no, I'm sure. I'm, if, I'm sure I could give you all, different kinds of stories for each poster. It's just whatever poster you've brought up tends to inspire a different there's a different memory I have from working on it than just how it was pitched to me. So, or how I came to, came to do it, you know? Um, yeah. But it, uh, yeah, with that one, he was just asking, Hey, do you have any interest in house of the devil? And I was like, yeah, let me give it another spin. I, I actually owned it. And I, I don't think I ever watched it. I bought it because I, Ty West did it. And I really liked the aesthetic of the, mm -hmm. of, of that film and how it looked. And I threw it on and I was like, yeah, this one's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, and then that was the concept that came to mind, just to the sort of the alive house. So it's, it's really a hard, hard 80s throwback with that poster. Yeah. Very, yeah, yeah. very reminiscent of VHS covers with the, the oversized sort of red block mm -hmm. intentionally kind of put there, even though you don't need that much of a block space. But it just reminds me of when VHS covers were shoddily adjusted, like or the one sheets were shoddily adjusted for a VHS cover. Like, we don't know how much space we're going to need for credit, so we're just going to block out half the case here. But in a way, there's an, there's an aesthetic um, to that that's actually really appealing, too. Now, what was the, the choice of the tongue? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, I think, it just it was inherently part of the concept of the, the house being more or less alive, you know, feeling like, you know, it, it is the house. of It's, a, it's pretty literal, okay. you know. In terms of, of what the concept is, I just wanted the execution of it to have a very um, clearly designed aesthetic, you know, a simple idea, but I wanted it to just, you know, have a very illustrative designed feel, a graphic, take some of my graphic design skills and really put that into the poster, you know. It's interesting. I mean, because that's you know the, the phrase. Uh, well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> comes to mind with that film. I can tell you like it. I love it. It's perfect. About the deposit, I'll agree to waive all the deposit stuff. You just give me the first month's down. We'll call it a day. All right. It's hard coming up with all that money, isn't it? Uh, it's gonna work out. You're not the one with eighty-four dollars in her bank account, and I checked her right on Monday. You know what you should do. Hi. I'm calling in regards to the babysitter flyer posted outside my dorm. The night's big eclipse is now well underway. I feel a little weird just dropping you out here like in the middle of wherever we are. You have to forgive me, Samantha, because I've not been completely honest. We're from the desert, you know. You see, we... We actually don't have a child. They lied to you. I know. Okay, I know you're right. But it's four hundred dollars. This equals first month's rent, and then some. And all I have to do is sit inside and watch TV. This is huge. This one night changes everything for me. Are you not the babysitter? Oh my god! Talk to me, Lord. Talk to me. more mm -hmm. so than any it's just like yeah all right you're plodding along where's this going okay an eclipse all right all right okay she's shot in the face let's go <laughs> yeah yeah and then i mean you know the strobe light is deployed in sort of like a magnificent <laughs> fashion yeah <laughs> like holy crap yeah i could have done without the what was it the grandma with this the face looked like a cat like yeah. <laughs> like, the like it made no sense i was just like eh. Uh, or the wife pulling off her wig. Yeah. <laughs> like to talk to the devil. Like talk to me, Satan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the transmission is getting interfered by your weed. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the satanic panic stuff will always be interesting just because it's essentially a global hysteria. 
Yeah. And that's just, and you know, it's just all that'll always be intriguing, even though it's a little on the nose these days. But, Have you seen you know, the new um, the, the new film, Satanic Panic? Did I see Satanic Panic? Is that the one? Uh, I believe. So. Does that Rebecca Romaine Stamos in it? Maybe. I don't remember the actors. Does it, does it, it end with with a girl on the altar supposed to give birth to to the Antichrist? Yeah, and she's birthed to bunnies. Yes. Yeah. That. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that movie. Not yeah, sure. It, I feel it's like got some moments. It's got some moments. Yeah. Another another uh, Satan movie with pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I saw um, that other one. We are. What is it? Will you summon us? Or they summoned us. Or the 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 girls. It's got um. What's the actress's name? Uh. We're not doing good with casts today. <laughs> no, no, no. I've only had I've only had three cups of coffee today, so I'm not myself. Um, anyways, it was it was another film that was just about essentially about satanic panic that didn't really deliver personally. But gotcha. you know, keep trying, keep trying. I know. Um, I got two really obscure ones for you. You got Freaked for Mondo from the 90s uh which i believe you describe yourself as an acid trip <laughs> that's what it is uh, have you ever seen it <laughs> i have uh yeah it was funny because i was talking to uh karen renner over the weekend about just like the movies we watch but freak though freak i could talk all day about but i won't um <laughs> but uh i'm a big fan of alex winter uh, bill and ted's my favorite Bogus Journey is my favorite film yeah. of all time. And I've worked on that property many, many, many times and continue to. And without without um tiring, I love it. I love it to death. And Freaked, um, I also love. And it is an overlooked gem, 90s gem that captures MTV in the 90s. And like the last sort of rebellion of like those music TV stations that they used to have, you know, when they still had that like, fuck the establishment, screw the corporation. We're like, a bunch of punks and you know outcasts running a tv station that's killing it by the way you know and um and we had a station here in canada too called much music and it was they were they were on par like there were no rules you know it was like your friends running a tv station but but it was huge um and uh so i just love freak and alex winter is he's a wonderful human he's very kind and uh very smart and very creative and i think that freaks was just Oh, it's just such a masterpiece to me. Um, and it just, I can see of, the love in your face. It's yeah. Like, it, well, like to find something else like it that you won't. The closest you'll find is pre Alex's previous work doing the Idiot Box TV series on MTV back in the 90s, which eventually led to Freaked Happening. You know, it's that like, I mean, I guess you can, you can find some of that sketch comedy now a little bit. There's like, you know, you have your Tim and Eric's and, and your Eric Andre show and some things like that. But um, freaked is there's been nothing like that film since that film came out, you know. And uh, as soon as Mondo was like, "Hey, you, you we know that you love Bill and Ted, but do you like Freaked?" and I was like, "Sign me up, just sign me up right now." And I can, I, and that stylistically, that poster too is very different from everything else I've done. I kind of tried to approach it the way the title sequence of that film was done by, um, I believe his name is. Oh, I'm gonna feel so bad if I mess this up, but Daniel, Daniel John, Daniel. Dan John, I think he was the he was the um, he he created the whole title sequence full claymation, sort of okay. um, the crazy. And so I wanted to capture that in the artwork. So I kind of came at it with a sort of very loose painterly style. It was still done all digitally, but I wanted to be a lot looser than my normal work and have messier lines and strokes and things like that. And just I wanted it to feel of the era. You know? Yeah. No, I, th I think it does. I mean, it's and it's just interesting to see. I mean, that's boogers and like, slime and Nickelodeon and gross and farts and like you know, like that's just <laughs> what you think about when you think about that time. You know, what was considered fun, like Beavis and Butthead and yeah, and Ren and Stimpy and Ren and Stimpy, just gross, gross out of stuff, right? That's what it was yeah. about back then. Because Ren and Stimpy was all like showing you what you've been chewing on, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 man. And, and belly button lint that had more in it than it would ever be possible <laughs> yeah. yeah like the, yeah those cut cards the cut cards from uh Ren and Stimpy, they're like what's in your hand and it's like a full rendered painting of like the most nasty thing you'd ever see yeah. you know yeah it's fantastic 
Uh, from there, you moved into, uh, again, some major properties. You did uh, the 40th anniversary uh, Halloween for Horror Hound magazine, mm-hmm. um, which I think is one of your more like, beautiful pieces in terms of- Oh, like, thanks. The yeah, there, there will, no, I actually really like that piece. That was, um, yeah, they, they needed an official poster for the event. Um, and then I kind of convinced them to do a, like a, an art print, to let me do an art print of it without any text or anything, because I think the image was strong enough. But- there were some there were some guidelines for that. Essentially, they were like, "We need you to show." I think they were essentially like, "We need you to show that forty years has passed, but we don't want you to 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 show for it to be a Halloween two thousand and eighteen poster." Mm. So they wanted to, to to show the forty years. So essentially, I was like, "Okay, well, mask." If but if we have to play into the hands of nineteen seventy eight and then two thousand and eighteen. You know, I'm. I, there's a, dig- a digression in the mask. You know, it ages and it gets old. It just falls apart. So, I did that essentially by showing the mask pristine to one side, slowly aging to the left, and then pieces breaking away. However, the pieces are, you know, leaves and autumn leaves. So, and uh, and I really had to drive it home. And be like, let's 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 keep this very tasteful and and um, and and you know, uh, like not not historic. That's not what I want to say, but. Just paying tribute to the to how how far the film has come and how many people it's reached, and just make it very classic. Yeah, I mean it's it's this wonderful, beautiful dissemination of uh, the image, and also I mean it harkens too to some of like the weird supernatural we've talked about a lot in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, his abilities to disappear and reappear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of I'm crazy. just glad you didn't you didn't make a Thanos stroke because you know. <laughs> I didn't even think about it till you just said it, to be honest. That's all it was. That's all I would have got. Not in a bad way. No, no. People love the posters, thankfully. But it was like, as soon as it was poster, it was just comment after comment. was just like, and I've never even seen the Mar- those Marvel movies, so I don't even okay. know. But I know the movie now from seeing it all in gift form. So I always liked it when people took like the, the Spider-Man toys and just replaced it with dust in the package. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was pretty. Uh, yeah. Pretty. Yeah. Uh, now I have this piece and we had both Roman and Tyler uh, on in October. You did the uh, official poster for Scream Queen. Yeah. Oh, Roman and Tyler. They're wonderful. They're amazing. So nice. Uh, so you did that through 1984 publishing. Mm. Uh, and I believe this was your first glitter poster. <laughs> second. A second glitter poster. What was the first yeah. glitter poster? The fly variant had a glitter overlay on it. Did it? Yeah. Okay. And that's how I knew to do it for this one because I knew that it was possible okay yeah so you you appropriated the well kind of the the dance sequence Jesse performs, mm-hmm. uh, and then of course you had, <laughs> yeah, Uh-oh. yeah, and, and again avoided putting a face in. <laughs> well, the the approach to that was a little complicated because I had to be careful how it read. Sure, right? Because it, it um, the documentary is fantastic. I love that film, and it made me cry the first time I saw it. Um, and um, so I knew that it had, it had to, it had to convey the right message, and I didn't want anything to seem out of, 
be taken out of context. But at the same time, there is a humor throughout the film and, there, and there's a humor to everything and an uplifting sort of like, we can, you can laugh and everything's okay. Like, let's not make it super serious. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um, so first off, I, I kind of, that concept had come to mind. I don't remember how, but I think I, I essentially at one point wanted to, I wanted to make a Nightmare on Elm Street 2 art print, like not even a poster, just of Jesse. Cause he's an underrated, he was an underrated character. You know, like I said before, I love part two. It was the first nightmare I ever saw. Sure. And I actually think it's the scariest Freddy has ever been. Who's in that okay. film. Um, yeah, well, the, the pool scene is pretty <laughs> intense. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, he, he's terrifying looking. He, that's when he really got, he had that very witchy sort of look to him. But anyway, so I, but I knew that the, the dance scene was very iconic. And as soon as I watched the documentary, I knew that the concept would work. And mm -hmm. that it kind of, it thinly veiled, it, but it was thinly veiled in a very serious um, context of what the documentary was about and about Mark's life. And so on the surface, the poster, yeah, it looks very fun. It's very glittery. It's, you know, it's him doing the dance. He's got the Freddy glove, but there, there is, is a rooted concept there in regards to, to sort of essentially Mark, I guess, having to, disappear and and the, the cover-up of, of someone's own identity and being forced to to hide and, and not be who you are and that's kind of I mean I, I don't want to be too descript in, in in what the concept is because I, I think people can tell for themselves but the glove the glove in that poster is essentially something else um and I mean I'll let people interpret it from there on but yeah the the it was it was such a fun project too. I was honored to do it too. Um, but yeah, the challenge was trying to create something that was fun, iconic, but also alluded to a much more serious conversation that, that we needed to be having, you know? So yeah, but I love Mark. Mark's, he's so wonderful. And, and Roman and, and, and Tyler, they're, they're great. We did a sound, uh, soundtrack for that too. So I got to kind yeah. of tweak the artwork again for that. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I would work with them on anything if they were asked. Okay, and 1984 uh, publishing mm -hmm. on that one. Uh, they're, they're they're relatively new, I think. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm I know Matthew very well, uh, Matthew Chojnacki, who uh, who owns 1984. He's a good friend. He's very nice, very good. Another cat. Matthew. Yeah, all the Matts are the best. Now, what can I say? Oh, taking over the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many Matts, man. I it's because we're part of the Tetramorph. There's too many mats. I grew up in, in, in the, you know, in the nineties, I had like eight mats in my class. It was the worst name to have. I was the only one, oddly enough. Yeah. Matt, if you were Matt, Mike, Dan, or Dave, you were screwed. Your individual, your individualism was thrown right at the door from the, from the get go. You were going to be uh, called by the la your last name from then on out. Oh, geez. Um, you've got dead is better, which obviously is a pet cemetery piece. Mm-hmm. That was for Horror Hound Magazine again. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, I mean, the, the concept of it is interesting because it sort of like comes together as you move deeper. Right, right, in, yeah. Into the piece, um, which I, I think blends in with what you've done in the past with, you know, trying approaching it differently mm -hmm. uh, and, and finding your niche uh, to get into it. Um, I couldn't, and, and maybe this is not delving which pet, this was for the original pet cemetery it's for whichever one you want it to be for okay that's okay <laughs> yeah i mean it was originally supposed to be for i think the original that was the idea or no was it for the remake oh god i can't even remember um, <laughs> but but it's it's essentially it can be used for either i mean the only differentiating factor would be um pascal um it's the, the the face that was referenced that's hidden in the cat was mm. more referenced towards him but it's so subtle that it's it essentially more or less looks like any man's face yeah i think so so it can be interpreted for either or and i think that's a a good thing to have done but uh even though the new film wasn't fantastic but yeah yeah um do you usually are you usually at Freightmare? Because you've you've mentioned it a few times, and obviously that's down in Austin as well. As my um, I have been there three times, I think three or four. 
I think three, three years I've gone there. And I think five years I've had arcs there for Mondo, but mm -hmm. three years I've gone and it's the best time. That's my, my favorite um, work trip that I get to go on is uh, going to Texas Frightmare. Yeah, it's a blast. Were you there in 2019 for your Exorcist release? Yep. Yeah, I was there. I was actually at the booth that year uh, signing and I, uh, I couldn't actually get a booth that year because that place is, you, you know, they're booked up years in advance. But yeah. um, I was able to, to sling some original drawings over at Mondo's booth and, and sign the posters. And so that's a lot of fun. I love doing that and talking to people. So um, the Exorcist is actually my favorite horror film. So I'm curious as to how you chose the image you went with for it. Um, I remember now. Um, again, this is another one where I think Mondo pitched me The Exorcist. Okay. And again, it's actually a film that hasn't been tackled too frequently. Um but originally the, the concept, what you see of the poster, the final product is actually half of the poster of what the poster oh, was it? intended to be. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I actually haven't shared the original concept because it was fully rendered. It was like done. And then um, it was a creative decision on Mondo's part, which I actually agree with in the long run um, to be like, hey, how about we subtract something? It wasn't like a crazy amount. It was just like, I mean, when I say half the poster, I mean like there was something else going on in the background. Okay. And then when we removed it was me putting too much meaning into something that didn't have, need as much meaning. Okay. And we removed that aspect of it. Essentially, it was a, it was a, a Pazuzu statue mm -hmm. um, aspect of it. We removed it, and I was like, "This is actually a lot creepier." Just with the cross on the wall, um, and so again, it was like a less is more thing, and it just worked. But uh, yeah, originally it had this whole thought out concept, and you know uh, that. That ended up being a lot less but the idea was to just i just tried to make a really scary exorcist poster in the end i mean originally there was more like i said there was more of a concept to it with the other aspect but doing sort of a hero shot of, of, of reagan um you know and, and on the surface it looks like she's facing forward right right but well, it you, kind of is you, right right but then in when you way. look at when you look at the hands and the feet you realize no <laughs> yeah and it's how, you know, the whole aspect of, of her head is turned away from the cross. Like she's shunning, like she's, you know. Yeah. So. You also, for Mondo and Death Waltz, you, uh, you have massive packaging of Hellraiser 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to like get into just how complex all of this is, what you've done. Yeah, uh, it's a lot with, of stuff. With Hellraiser. Uh, I, I will tell you... Um, I'm going to pick out a couple of things. Uh, okay. I, I very much like the pinhead being formed from the chains. Uh, for Which your one was that? It was your oh, Hellraiser. the box set. The box yeah, set. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the cover, uh, the slipcase for the whole set. Yeah, that's that's hands down my favorite part of the entire all out of all of that artwork that I did is is the slipcase. That's my I favorite. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel so vindicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have. Did you do you have it? I do have that. Okay, um, you'd be surprised say, how much of your say, stuff I'll, I have. I'll, send, I'll, I'll be like, I'll send you down one, but because um, I have like two boxes full of them. <laughs> oh wow! Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we yeah that that slipcase was was a nice sort of uh, end cap on on the whole series. I mean, I don't think that I I never intended to have it, the whole all three of them sort of coexist like that or you know to, for them to complement each other as companions but it just seemed like the, the fitting idea the mood was really captured with the first one and i was like you know what let's let's just carry this across and mm. um and have it and that way we can do a, a whole set you know and but um yeah the slipcase is definitely my favorite i think actually part two um hellbound that cover yeah. is my favorite that's my favorite cover that's my favorite um, of that series too is yeah, Hellbound is pretty, it's pretty fantastic, yeah. Again, it's like we were talking about the sequel talk. It's part one, just cranked to 11. It's like a little bit more rock and roll is thrown yeah. into every sequel. Every sequel, you know what I mean? Including Hellbound. A little bit more rock and roll than the first one. Are, are, you, are you a Hellraiser fan? I'm a general Hellraiser fan. I say I okay. like it as much as anybody who says, yeah, I like Hellraiser. Like that. I wouldn't say that I'm a diehard fan, though. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, the original idea was that Julia would be the villain, not, not Pinhead. 
Right. Well, a pinhead was nothing more than like a, I don't know if a catalyst is the right word, but he was just a secondary character. Yeah. And, but he was the one who became, you know. Well, because of, because of the, the box, oh, because of the film in the rental store, the box with him. And yeah. that just sort of like exploded him into yeah. this yeah. thing, uh, which is, is, is rather fascinating. To like being the I think it's disheartening that, I think it's disheartening that in those early, the earlier films that we didn't get enough of him and then people clamored for him. And then what they got later was far from, I think, what people wanted. But um, he would have been a, a great character to delve even deeper into and just have more moments with him in, but mm. in those earlier iterations, I think. I don't know. I, I think less is more in these cases because I, I feel the same way about Hannibal Lecter. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like it's really perfect in Silence yeah. of the Lambs. And then I don't need Hannibal or Red Dragon, or I certainly don't need Hannibal Rising. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I see what you mean. And, I'm, and normally I'm one of those. I, I, I'm one of those people too that will agree with that le, le, less of an origin makes a character more intriguing but I guess I'm just going based off of what is sort of you can call it shoehorned in in the third film about him you know essentially being a good guy but I really like yeah. that aspect I did like the aspect of him having a soul at one point and being so enamored with this box that he lost it and there's there's something about that that I do like sometimes the origin story can work um i think it could have been done better in in terms of pinade for such a um legendary character but you know um i got i got three more pieces to ask you about matt okay i have to pee so bad <laughs> uh i want to ask you real quick because we, we've talked a lot about it on here we talked about Candyman a lot and you have a daniel mm -hmm. robotide piece mm -hmm. um Yours is significantly different than most Daniel Robitaille pieces I've seen as well, uh, because it's actually less torturous. Uh, which yeah, is, I, well, I wanted it to be sad. I wanted yeah. it to feel more sad than, than anything, because again, like when we talked about the fly, like there's, there's a romance story that's being glossed over here. And it's the same with Candyman. Like everyone's like, oh, Candyman, hook, bees, guts, violence. It's like, no, you're missing. I think you're missing some of the, the importance of, of who this character is and why he died and why that's so awful. And, yep. you know, that's what I wanted to focus on is, is the story, not, not the scariness of a character. There's, it goes way deeper, you know. Have you seen the new uh, paper puppet trailer for the Yes. New yeah. Oh, my God. It made my hair stand, stand on end. It was, uh, I cannot wait for this new film. That 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 sold me right there. Just seeing that that short or that trailer. Uh, Robin uh, Armin's Coleman, who wrote Horror Noir, was on, uh, mm -hmm. and, and and she actually showed it to us because we hadn't seen it. Um, and it, it was just astounding, astounding. Uh, to see. I mean, yeah. it was really, really, really amazing. Yeah. Uh, then you've partnered with Shutter. You did the Cursed Films poster. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is a sort of like a. Mm, a TV doc kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, like a, a, a series documentary. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, great. It's interesting because I feel like you tapped right into the Shutter aesthetic, you know, just instantaneously. Oh well, I, yeah, I don't know. They um, they did not want to go that route at all. <laughs> interesting. Excuse me, as far as I can remember, they had a very sort of direct idea. They had an idea in their heads that they wanted to do, but I'm just not that kind of artist. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't know. My my old punk punk rock roots won't let me. Be. <laughs> I know maybe that's it. No, but it's just like I feel like more often than not, if if you if if um if there's an, an artist or or or, or a per anybody in the world who who who's good at doing what they do, it's it's almost more often than not just letting them do it their way will often turn out the way you want it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like a yeah so then i really had to push for another direction to go and i pushed and pushed and pushed for that that concept to happen and i was and um and then again sometimes it takes people seeing things done to understand the the full scope mm. and in this this was the case and so i really fleshed out a rough so i took it way past the stage i normally would before approval okay i thought i thought it would be such a fun poster to do and they're like, yeah, no, that works. And I was like, I knew it would. I just had to, you know, this it's is. It's so funny to me because like I say, it looks so much like a shutter. 
<laughs> Either that, or maybe you've defined that for me <laughs> aesthetically. <laughs> well, maybe that's I mean, what they, happened. they they picked references from from my portfolio. Like they they knew the palette they wanted. Mm. Like it was down to those type of specifics. Like they wanted those, you know, '90s '80s turquoisey greeny hues, and and they they wanted it to feel from from the '80s. They that that was one thing they wanted to drive home. Yeah. And so when they said that, and then some of the ideas that they had. Which were great, albeit they were they were good ideas. It just wasn't in it wasn't something that I would do personally. Someone sure. else could definitely execute them in a different way um, and effectively. But uh, yeah, it was just like you know, uh, yeah, we'll work those in. Like uh, you know, I'm not absolutely against um, if a studio or a, or a client has something they want to see. Absolutely, we'll, we'll compromise in, in any way we can to get you what what they're happy with, but. It was again just a gut feeling. I was like, I think this is going to be really cool. And you know what? If if I do it and you don't like it, then we'll go back. We'll go back to the drawing board. But but hear me out. You know, hear me out. It's just because I, I care. It's just because I care, Matthew. That's why. <laughs> the last piece I got for you is your uh, crow, the crow for Mondo. Mm. Uh, and I kind of wanted to finish on this one, um, not because it's. I think it's fairly recent, but oh, yeah. it, uh, month, month it also ago. seemed to be really uh, almost personal in a lot of ways for you uh, when I read what you'd written about it. Well, it's, it's, you know what, it's strange. And I, I, I'll correct you there. I'll say it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a super personal thing for me. Um, however, uh, it, there was some nostalgic value to it because when I was a kid, when the crow came out, I was, I think I was really, I really liked it a lot. Like I was very obsessed with, with the look, the face paint. I think I was even, Eric Draven one year for Halloween. I don't have any pictures of it. I wish I did. But I actually, I posted a photo on my Instagram recently of a, a drawing that my mom tracked down in her, her bin of storage that she kept that I drew when I was like seven years old of The Crow that I drew. And it was like, it looked like a movie poster too. It had the title and everything on it. And I was like, oh, that's pretty. And then that started to sort of bring back memories. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I remember watching this at my cousin's house. And I was this old and, and I you know, had to go home and I had to rent it again. And, and then these thoughts started coming back. But when I was working on the poster, it was actually watching, watching the Cursed Films episode okay. about the crow that reignited my passion for it. I was like, man, I would love to do a crow poster and nobody's done a crow poster. So I actually pitched to Mondo. So I, I had like three versions of a concept that I pitched to Mondo. I said, hey, no one's done the crow, really. I'd love to do the crow. Here are my ideas. They go, hey, you know, we just acquired the crow. <laughs> what are the chances? Um, and then, but actually, my first idea to this idea are completely different. So there's a circumstance too where the first idea wasn't the best idea, and it took um, some brilliant creative direction from uh, from uh, Rob Jones and Eric Garza over at Mondo um, to help me steer it down another direction. But it's, it still felt like what I had intentionally pitched. Um, but they're amazing for taking something that you've done and elevating it versus being like, no, don't do that. Do this. It's like, here's how we make these tweaks that make this better. You know, so it always remains your art, which that that's the sign of a fantastic art director. Um, and so, yeah, that's a completely different story than all the other ones I've given you. You know, I pitched the idea and it actually completely changed we got from, there. Inception, <laughs> from inception <laughs> to the end. So there you go. So there's a different circumstance, but yeah, uh, yeah, the poster was received well, which, which made me very happy because, yeah, working on it, I probably watched the crow three or four times in the process of making that poster. Um, and uh, I just, again, I was just trying to capture the feeling of it and pay tribute to an actor who's, who was taken way too quickly um, and uh, just, just do the character justice rather than trying to get too, too deep into the concept do you know what I mean? Let's just let's just pay tribute to a, a, a great film and a great actor, and not get too caught up in, you know, all the, the poetic jazz, you know, and that's that type of stuff. So, final question for you: What mm -hmm. horror property is out there that you still long to do? I mean, we've gone through quite a few today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, one that I've longed to do. There's one I really want to do, and it's uh, it's it's actually it's not even like it's not even um, random. It's not even okay. a niche title, and that's Psycho. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Do, do you know what you would do? Yep. Yes. Not, not going <laughs> to tell me, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Psycho is a big one for sure. I love that film. Um, I know that's so cliche to say, but it's just, it's, it's fucking Psycho, man. Like, what do you... Well, let me ask you, you this thing. It's What's your great. favorite Psycho poster that's out there already? I have it on my wall in my office right now. I can't see it because I can't turn my monitor because <laughs> everything will disconnect from the back of it. Yeah. But it's um, Tomer Hanuka's Psycho. Okay. And it's right there on my wall, right there. It's, um, <laughs> it's done by Mondo quite a few yeah. years back. I had to track it down after the fact. Um, but it's, yeah, wonderful, wonderful poster. Okay. Yeah, Tomer well, Hanuka. We're, we're, we're all going to look forward to your, uh, your version of Psycho. One day, one day. One day. We'll, see, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. You never know. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. And until Thanks for next having time, me. Stay spooky. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs>